So when I asked Shelley how to plan the talk, she said I could assume everyone had at least a PhD in computer science. Is everybody okay with that? <laughs> okay, let's we'll see what we can do. So what I want to do is talk about sort of two topics uh, at a high level, cloud computing uh, and then big data and how they fit together uh, and sort of give you a little bit of background at both, uh, hopefully to make you dangerous so that at parties this weekend you can use terms like cloud computing, big data, and Hadoop uh, and impress your friends. Uh, and then also I'll give like a shameless plug for some of our work at uh, UCI towards the end. So first of all, like what is cloud computing? And so one place you can go find out is you can go actually do a search on the term and you'll find that the National Institute of Standards has actually come up with a pretty nice explanation. And so if you wonder what it is, this is actually a pretty good way of thinking about it. So I'll, I'll sort of read it to you and then try to translate it. So it's a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access, as in you can get to it, uh, to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, meaning you know, the stuff that you're getting access to is not just yours, it's not just on your laptop anymore, it's kind of out there somewhere, but you can access it, it's shared with others. Uh, and that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction, as in if you need more or you want less, that those kinds of changes can happen. Uh, so it's all about kind of the shared thing that's out there somewhere, but you can get at it, and if you need more, you can get it fast. And if you don't need, you know, as much, you can let it go and those things can happen, and so sort of a pay-as-you-go for what you need model for computing, or what some people have called utility computing. So this is kind of what uh, NIST says cloud computing is about. Um, and so there's different kinds of clouds, and we'll look at what NIST says about them, but kind of notice that there are low-level clouds that we find in the sky, there are medium-level clouds, and there are high-level clouds, and the same thing is true in cloud computing. Um, so, so those sort of different layers also exist, uh, in the NIST model and in what you find out there actually is things that people are doing. So there's sort of different service models. So the idea of cloud computing is you're getting at services that are being provided to you sort of by someone for some reason, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, software as a service is kind of the, the highest model where what you're accessing is actually kind of in programs. So there's an example of a company, probably one of the most successful sort of software as a service companies called Salesforce.com, which does Salesforce management uh, it's a whole application for managing the sales force of your business. You don't have to have the software on the computers. It happens in the cloud. Kind of at a lower level, there are companies like Google that are making it possible for people who want to develop applications to build their applications and run them in the cloud, in the Google Cloud in their case. And so they offer this model called Google Apps, and that's considered a platform for building applications. So that's kind of the mid-level platform as a service. And then Amazon is willing to sort of give you computers and disks off in the cloud and you can sort of build your own platform and build your own uh, software on top of that. So they're getting what they call infrastructure as a service. So those are kind of the layers of cloud. Kind of no matter what the layers are, the characteristics that you find at each one of those levels, kind of what I went through on the first slide, that you can get stuff on demand. You can do it kind of by yourself when you need it. You don't have to sort of engage in a whole acquisition process. It's just there and available for you. Uh, you can access it over the internet. Um, it's from pooled resources, so that the company that's offering it kind of gets the advantage of pooling the resources and giving it to who needs it right now, and gets some balancing between different needs at different times. Rapid elasticity, so if you, you know, create a web startup and it becomes really popular really fast, you can scale up by getting sort of more processing, for example, from Amazon. And then measured service so that you can sort of keep track of how much you're using, and also this company can optimize sort of how they're using their resources for you. And then there's different kinds of clouds. It's a notion of a private cloud where you're basically doing this within your company, uh, but it's kind of your data center and you're sharing it among divisions in your company. Community cloud might be there for like a whole community. Maybe the intelligence agencies would get together and have a community cloud that others couldn't get to but would be for their community. The notion of a public cloud where sort of anyone can get to it or clouds that are kind of mixed up from those. And so those are the kind of the, the way that NIST thinks about cloud computing and it's a pretty good, I think a pretty good characterization. So how does the cloud affect your life? Well, so on the personal level, for individuals, you probably use Gmail or some other service like that, and so your mail service is off in the cloud. Um, you, you know, if you use sort of uh, you know iPhone and you're storing your music in the cloud uh, or your videos in the cloud, if you use sort of Amazon digital content, you know, again, there are things that you own, but they're somewhere else. They're being managed for you and stored for you, and hopefully they'll be there when you go to get them again. Um, Google Docs is a service in the cloud where you can create spreadsheets and, and you can create Word documents, like Word-like documents, other things, and share them in the cloud. And then social networks are sort of providing a service for you know interaction and collaboration and you know sharing. You know, I just checked into you know my kitchen or whatever uh, in the cloud. And so basically, those are ways in which things in the cloud are essentially you're interacting with probably on a daily basis. 
Um, so what's you know good about the cloud? You can get to your stuff from anywhere. You can do it from different devices. So your laptop, you can get your email. Your cell phone, you can get your email, and so on. Um, you kind of get on-demand storage and computing for your stuff, so you don't have to uh, sort of own as much computer power as, as you might have to with once upon a time. And certainly not as much storage as you would have had to. It's usually free, uh, quote unquote free, as in when you use it, there's advertising you know, sort of being offered to you, and that's what's paying for the service, or they're you know, gathering information about what you're doing and what you're saying, and they're selling it to somebody else. Somehow they're basically making money uh, off of your use of their service, and that's why you don't pay for it. Or maybe you're paying for it, in which case it's funded by you. Um, and then the other thing about the cloud, going away from kind of the personal example, is little companies or medium-sized companies that once upon a time maybe couldn't afford a whole Salesforce management kind of application can go buy that service now. So they can have kind of enterprise class service that they maybe wouldn't have had once upon a time. Uh, downsides, you know, your stuff is now in somebody else's hands, right? So you have to be sort of feeling good about that. I got an email recently. I don't store my photos in the cloud. It was from Kodak saying, you know, we're not in the business anymore, and, and you know, Shutterfly or somebody else is taking it over. So there is this little question of how does the stuff that you own in the cloud, you know, so what happens when the companies go away? Um, it's not in your, you know, your box in your basement or in your, your, uh, you know, your safe place anymore. Um, your stuff is largely visible unless you've encrypted it somehow uh, to the cloud service provider. And so you know, you're using Gmail, uh, and Google knows what's in your Gmail. Hopefully, they won't do anything that you don't want them to do with it. But you sort of have to trust that they're you know, going to deal with your data the way you want them to. And so there are issues around availability and trust and privacy, lots and lots of issues that have to be dealt with and are being dealt with, you know, being litigated about and being discussed and being researched as to you know, how can we put stuff in the cloud and not let the provider see it and so on. Okay, so that's sort of the cloud. So what about data? Well, it's cloudy and it's actually raining data. Right? So, so we're using the internet, we're all using it. We didn't all used to use it. It used to be just sort of geeks who wanted to send email to each other about the next version of Unix, that's not what it's like anymore. Uh, so we have this kind of mushrooming internet use, except for you guys, because you all have PhDs in computer science, of course. Uh, and so generating data, we're all generating lots of data. Tweets, blogs, social networks, you know, we're doing things that are generating data, we're doing things on websites that are generating click streams that companies are looking at, and we're doing things, you know, on services like eBay, and they're keeping track of how their applications are running, and they're analyzing their business that way. Uh, you know, if you look at Facebook, you see they have almost a million active users now. Uh, and they process, these are numbers that are probably old by now, but they were processing a few months ago 8 billion messages a day because they just redid their messaging infrastructure. Uh, so they were sort of paying attention and telling people about that. Um, Twitter has, you know, sort of 140 million active users as of a few months ago, and they're getting like over 300 million tweets a day. So this is all data that's getting generated on a daily basis. And the other thing that's interesting about big data is that it's not just for you know, sort of computer science PhDs like us, right? It's also that the kind of the sort of the, everybody is getting interested. The trade press is talking about big data. You can pick up, you know, you know, magazines that are about, you know, sort of current popular science things or the economy or New York Times, and there will be articles talking about big data. So then all the enterprises, web companies, businesses, and so on, uh, people in sciences and so on are also getting very excited about big data and what can be done, because essentially there's sort of untapped value there. All this data is being generated. Surely we can learn some stuff for it, and I'll talk about, a little bit about that. Uh, and there are lots of opportunities to look at that data, understand what's going on, to optimize what you're doing in response to what you start to understand, and to compete kind of in whatever business you're in, based on looking at some of this sort of big data. It's actually kind of unraining data. It's not coming down, it's going up. Right? So we've got all these tweets <laughs> happening, and check-ins, and likes, and dislikes, and blogs. And we're creating what some people are calling sort of our digital exhaust, right? We're kind of walking along, and behind us, all this data is sort of trailing and, and flowing up into the cloud. And the question is, how do we get it, analyze it, uh, and sort of share it? And what are the opportunities for big data? Things like, you know, what things we can learn. So, uh, you know, what are the opportunities for someone who wants to sell you stuff? It's like helping to, to, to advise you on what you should buy. People like you have also, you know, sort of, when they bought that, they also bought this. What should you listen to? So the people who are listening to your music are also listening to these new artists, you might want to check them out. You know, who should your friends be tomorrow? Facebook spends each evening figuring out who to advise you tomorrow it should be your new best friend. Um, you know, how do customers feel about your product? So if you have a business, if you look at what's being tweeted about your product, you can now learn things about how your customers feel about that. You don't have to necessarily run these sort of marketing groups. You know, who's going to win the presidential election if you're a sort of a studier of, of politics? You know, you can look at that and try to figure that out from blogs and from social media, or if you're a, you know, if you're behind a candidate, how can you help your candidate win the election? You know, where should they be putting their advertising dollars, or what state should they be focusing on? Um, you know, there are famous examples of sort of being able to tell from tweets, you know, kind of how the flu epidemic was sweeping 
sort of through the world. You know, maybe there's going to be a, a huge political uprising in Switzerland, and so you know, maybe we need to find that by looking at tweets. Um, you know, clearly, if you're looking at sort of what's being blogged about and, and, and things, maybe you could detect some signals about terrorist activity, or you know, you can go back and look at the big data from last year and look at the event from the middle of last year and ask questions like, how could we have seen that coming? How could we have handled that situation better? Emergency response situation, how could we have sort of dealt with it better? Uh, and so we're at a point where there's all these kinds of things you can learn from big data, and people are making arguments or people are acting in ways that basically indicate that we've reached a time where the cost of storage has gotten so low that it's almost more expensive to think about what to throw away. And you're going to maybe throw away something that would turn out to be valuable later, that you should just start keeping stuff. And so, for example, Roger Barger, who's one of the big data guys at Microsoft, gave a keynote last month where he basically said, five to six years, that's the threshold. Don't throw anything away for at least five to six years, because there might be value there. And actually, as I was on the way to hear that keynote, uh, sort of flying across the Atlantic, I was reading an article in Bart Magazine about the NSA's new data center, and they're keeping everything in hopes that they can decrypt it someday. It has no value right now because they can't read it, but they think maybe you know, 10 years from now they can read it and go back and understand it. Uh, so we're at a point where there's lots of data being generated and lots of possible value. And so what are the challenges that like, people who are working in this field are looking at who are sort of plumbers like me trying to build systems to help people deal with big data? It's like the data is really big. It's, it's, it used to be terabytes, now it's petabytes, it's going beyond that. You know, how do we scale up, build systems that can scale to that large data? Uh, data is coming pretty fast, so things like Twitter. There's a, a new buzzword, fast data. So be sure to drop that one at cocktail parties. Uh, you know, I, I'm working on fast data. How do we keep up with all the data that's being generated at a rapid rate and sort of get it stored and get it analyzed and, and do what we need to with it? Um, the data is not structured like business data. It's semi-structured or unstructured text. How do we model the data and extract information from it? Um, there's tons of different sources. How do we ingest those and integrate them and sort of cross? You know, realize that this data, that these blogs and these tweets are the same person. Um, and then there's all kinds of data, sort of interesting data types, spatial data. We're now all walking around with our cell phones, and sometimes when we check into places, we let the system know that. And so we're now at a point in some you know, geographic space. And so there's a lot of geographic information that can be used. Textual information, obviously, and also graphs, by which I mean social graphs. And so people are sort of getting a lot of value by looking at who you're friends with, and that can help them to figure out you know, who your other friends ought to be, or what to recommend, or you know, other things like that. So a lot of networks in the graph sense. Um, and so the current commercial answer for plumbers who want to sort of solve problems related to big data is there's this yellow elephant called Hadoop, uh, which is a sort of, this is definitely something you should use at parties. Um, it is a, a, a data intensive computing platform for analyzing big data. Basically, you can take a whole bunch of computers, hook them together with a network, and sort of set them loose on big data and write what are called map reduced programs to analyze that big data. And so, what a lot of companies are doing is essentially sort of starting to use this in addition to their normal data technologies um, using Hadoop, uh, using its file system called HDFS, which is a file system for handling you know, petabytes of data and making three copies of it. Uh, and they're also using high level languages that basically allow them to write data analysis that compile down to that. Languages with sort of silly names like Pig, Hive, and Jackal. Pig is a language developed by Yahoo, which has gotten pretty popular. Hive is a language developed by Facebook, which about 90% of their analysts use to do the big data analysis to figure out who your friend's up to. Um, so that's kind of what's happening in big data technology. So I just want to close, because uh, I only get a few minutes here, um, with a, a quick pitch for what we're doing at UCI. So what we're asking, basically, if you look at the, the previous slide, um, if I can figure out how to back up in Windows, um, Hadoop is sort of the first generation of big data technology. It kind of came together by accident, and it's a somewhat clunky technology. And so what we're trying to do is ask the question, okay, if we know we're going to deal with big data, and we know that people want to do their big data analysis using high-level languages so they can do it productively and quickly, what should a system look like for that? And it won't take you through any of the details, but basically, we're trying to big, you know, build a big, scalable big data management system uh, here at BCI uh, to address some of the problems that we see coming and to be able to analyze this kind of data, to deal with spatial data and textual data and other kinds of data, all in parallel, uh, so that we can sort of help solve the big data kind of crisis that's impending, and be ready in time. So what we're essentially doing, the thing on the left is, sort of gives an indication, we're taking work that's been done in the past related to dealing with semi-structured or unstructured data, work that's been taken in the past of dealing with parallel data and parallel databases that you can sort of buy off the shelf, <laughs> Uh, and the current work in data intensive computing and Hadoop and mixing them together, kind of recycling and mixing those ideas to create a platform that I'm sort of showing at the bottom here. Basically, we're trying to build a, a, a big
big data management system called Asterix. Uh, on top of a foundation that we're building so that others can also, who have different ideas about big data management, can reuse the foundation. So we're building kind of a middle layer that people with other ideas about programming languages for big data can explore things with. And a bottom layer called Hyrax, which is the animal up in the right hand corner, which is a really fast sort of engine for doing data intensive computing. And we've been sort of racing the Hyrax against the elephant, and we find that the Hyrax can run about 10 times as fast as the elephant um, in, in a lot of kinds of problems and scales very well. Um, I won't take you through the details of the status, but we have a large project that we're sharing with uh, UC Riverside and also UC Davis, and we've been running our system on pretty large uh, hardware at Yahoo. We have some collaborators that were there until Yahoo Labs melted down about a month ago. Uh, so we're getting access to some very large parallel machines, and it's been sort of an interesting, uh, sort of exciting project in that sense, uh, working with about, about a dozen sort of graduate students at any one point in time on this. So that's just a quick overview of essentially sort of what, what's happening with cloud, what's happening with big data, and what we're trying to do at UCI, uh, this project called Asterix, and we're hoping to uh, sort of repurpose that book uh, in a few years. So I'll stop here, and I think questions are at the panel.